All right. Once again, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everyone. So welcome to this public MISP training. Before we, before we actually start, I just want to share with you the, the training notes. So I'm sharing them in the chat. We'll bring, bring them up on screen as well. So basically in this note, you have like the, the meeting link, um, some information about uh, the training for tomorrow and the day after. Um, so for those who are joining with your phone or whatever, you have a QR code, you can also join this uh, this training document with the tanyurl.com slash misp dash October slash 2024. In this document, you will also find information on how to join the training MISP instances that we offer to you. But it, these are public instances that you can access. Uh, it's basically a demo MISP instance. So just grab one of the user accounts, use the password, and we can play with it right away. Uh, just for your information about this uh, training instance, uh, it will remain open with the same credential for at least seven days. So if you want to like show it to other colleagues, play with it more after that training, feel free. Uh, but after seven days, we are not warranting that you will be able to, to join these instances anymore. So quick agenda for today. So this is the first day of the, of the public MIST training. It's uh, mainly about an introduction to, to intelligent sharing, uh, to MISP general usage and MISP concept. And tomorrow it's more about an advanced session that will cover a lot of things using administration of MISP, the API, integration and automations. Um, during the introduction, if you want to spend a bit of time, we have uh, created a short survey that's gonna take around three minutes for you to do. So if you're willing to participate, uh, feel free, it's not a requirement, it's just for us so that we know the public that we have today. Um, yeah, and then that's basically, it's more training materials or documentation if you want. All right, that being said, um, I just wanted to mention that this training will be recorded. Uh, we won't be recording the chat or whatever. Uh, and that brings me to one of the most important thing for this training today is that um, I have two colleagues here in the chat uh, that are more than pleased to answer any question you might have during this session. So do not hesitate at any point in time to, to ask your question in the chat and either they will bring them out uh, during the session or they will just reply in the chat directly. All right, so let's start the recording. That is the recording. All right. Okay, so let's go. Just a small comment before we start the training. Um, by attending this training today with, with us, uh, you won't become a MISP expert, that's for sure. Uh, MISP is a complex tool that has a lot of uh, features and stuff to discover. Uh, but the main idea of this training is uh, to like teach you the basics and raise some question and ideas on your side so that you have a desire to learn more and to delve deeper into the system. So who are we? Um, so today I'm basically part of the, of the MISP project. So, so are my colleagues. And MISP project is, uh, let's say, a general uh, uh, concept that regroups many open source uh, tools and platforms, but also open standards as you will see later on. Um, and all of us, uh, myself included, and my colleagues, we are working for Circle. So Circle is basically the, um, the cert for the private sector in Luxembourg. Uh, and we have communes and non-governmental entities. Um, so, so that you know a bit about our background. Now the relationship between MISP and Circle um, so we are basically leading the development of MISP, uh, MISP, uh, which is used by many uh, organizations in many types of sectors. And in addition to leading the development, we also run many MISP communities. Uh, I could name a few 
like uh, the first community, we are running communities for the telco sector, for the banking sector, and so on. Now, the question that uh, we have from time to time is where is this coming from? Where did it start? Um, so to give quickly a bit of credit, uh, it's uh, initially Christophe van de Plas, uh, who at that time was working for the CERT of the Bejan MOD, uh, that created that platform. That wasn't named MISP at the, at the time. It later became MISP. Uh, but he actually wanted to, to create a tool that would avoid duplication of work. So when you have multiple teams from the same company or even different companies that start on the same uh, cases or on the same malware in, the, in, in that uh, case, specific case, um, they were doing duplicated work. And so that's the main idea. So you start on this stuff, you share it with people, and then you can collaborate and improve uh, what you are working on. So that was at the time back in 2012, but now MISP is much larger than just a small tool. Uh, and it's fully community driven. Uh, and we'll see more in detail how that actually works, how the governance of MISP works. So what is MISP? Uh, in few words, MISP is basically a trend information sharing platform that is free and open source, meaning that you can install it, you can run it, you can look at the source code for free and it's available on the web. Um, so there are many use cases for using MISP and the one that most people are doing is just to use it as a, like a database uh, to store information, to normalize information, to correlate it and to like do some trade intelligence on your data. And uh, yeah, it's really, so the development has been steered in a way that collaboration is made easy between teams, but also between communities. And you will learn how to do all of that today. So we talk about that, the fact that MISP is community driven in terms of development. Um, that's because we re receive a lot of feedback from a lot of different types of users. So just to name a few, there are listed there, so malware reverser, intelligence analyst, law enforcement, fraud analyst, and so on. All of them, they have different use cases. And what we try to do in MISP is to cover all of them. That's also one of the reasons why the platform seems a bit convoluted uh, on offer a lot of features that you might think that's not really relevant for like traditional cyber trade intelligence, but that's because we have other use cases, we have other type of users uh, that use their MISP instance in their own ways. And that's totally fine. So to explain a bit uh, about the government governance on how the development in MISP is actually driven. Um, first of all, we have uh, um, a big event, like a, a yearly event called CTI Summit, formerly known as the MISP Summit. No, nowadays, it's not only about MISP, it's about CTI uh, in the broad sense. And uh, this event is great. It's going to happen end of the month, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so yeah, feel free to to check it out, uh, cti-summit.org. Uh, it's organized at the same time as the Akeliu for those who know. And this event brings together a lot of actors uh, that are using MISP and then are sharing what they're doing with the tool. Um, and based on that kind of feedback, we really steer the development on what we can do to like improve the tool so that it's easier for them to do their work. Of course, it's, it's an open source project. We have a heavy presence on GitHub and uh, open source channels such as Gitter. So we have a lot of issues. If you look at the GitHub repository of MISP, we have a lot of issues. And uh, most of them, well, most of them, I would say half of them are actually uh, um, notes for us or reminders or just open issues for discussion. So don't be afraid. It's not because we have an open issue that there is a bug in the tool. Um, but in addition to that, we also have two other kind of feedback. One of them being the MISP training. That's uh, typically what we are doing today. So if you have, if you are using the tools, or even if you are just new to the tool and think that some stuff could be improved, uh, please do not hesitate to provide feedback. It's very valuable to us to know uh, how we can improve the tool. And finally, 
um, it's we have like a worldwide user group, for example, bit, uh, based uh, on sectors. For example, I mentioned the telecommunication sector, or the banking sector, but other group like the retail sector, hospitality sectors, and so on. Uh, all of them uh, typically belong to what we call ISACs or similar structure. And uh, they provide us feedback, very valuable feedback. So if you're part of this group and they're using MISP and you're just there to learn about it today, uh, do not hesitate to like voice your concerns or voice your uh, feedback to this group so that they can convey that to us directly. All right. So I've mentioned we have a lot of different uh, type of use case and a lot of different user groups. And something that can be a bit tricky, especially when you uh, are dealing with false positives, uh, is what you actually want to do with the data that you have. So most of you today, I guess you are attending that training because whenever you receive an IOC, you want to block it. Like when you receive a malicious IP address or, mal or malicious binary or um, an URL that uh, is like delivering malicious payloads, what you actually want to do is to block it um, or, or detect it depending on which team you are in. Uh, but we have also other user groups that want to perform intelligence, so to dig more. And these guys, they're also interested in false positives. But you quickly realize that these two objectives can be quite conflicting because on one side you have people that want to have like timely vetted high value uh, IOCs that they want to block. Uh, and on the other hand, you have other people that just want to see like everything that, uh, that is happening on a specific case. Uh, they want to see server going up and down and so on to do proper uh, trade intelligence. And these two objectives are totally conflicting conflicting because if if you if you have for example a malware that tries to check if it has uh, internet connectivity on like uh, google.com uh, this is something that would be interesting for the the people that do trade intelligence uh, so you would like to have this data exported uh, but for people that want to block information they don't want to block google.com so that's why it can be quite conflicting but thankfully misp offer all the tools for you to prevent having this uh, false positive and ending, ending up in your systems. All right, so communities using MISP, I've mentioned quite a few. Uh, so to go quickly through the slides, uh, we have some trust, trusted group, financial sector. We also have military and international organization that are using a specific case of MISP. So even though MISP is all about sharing and being connected to other MISP communities, Typically, these sectors and communities, they're using MISP in an air gap environment. And that's totally fine. We even provide some uh, installer and updater to uh, to like to run this system in such an air gap uh, mode. We also have security vendors, uh, yeah, many communities using it. And MISP, we talk about it's all about sharing. Uh, but sometimes just sharing the technical aspect is not, uh, it's not enough. Uh, depending on the community you are in, you also have to, to take into account social interaction and trust. So if you are just here today, you join the random community, of course you're not going to put the same amount of trust that you would put in the community you've been in for uh, years and years. Uh, so that's one of the side of the difficulties when you talking about sharing. But another one is more about uh, the uh, practical restriction. So people tend to think that they don't have anything to share. Um, like they are consuming data and they think that there is no point for them to share because they don't produce anything of value. But that's not technically true because most of the time uh, they will collect data and they will notice that this is a false positive. This is not valid data anymore. And this is something that you can provide uh, feedback to the original creator of the data. Um, other practical restriction could be that the classification that is used uh, doesn't fit their model of classification, but this can also be solved with clever tools that we have in MISP. Uh, same for format. Uh, we have a lot of converter to import, well, to 
ingest and export different type of format. And we also offer you all the tools that you, you would need uh, if you have to design one for your own format. So really, we are really flexible uh, for that, uh, that aspect. No. So I've mentioned at the beginning the concept of MISP project because MISP is the tool, but we have MISP project, uh, which is uh, like an organization that encompass many different uh, other projects. So the one that we will talk about today is MISP score, so the MISP software, but we have also other tools or applications such as the MISP module that we also see today how you can use it. It's basically a tool that helps you to do enrichment on data or export or import from different formats. Like PyMISP, which is the Python wrapper around the MISP API. Um, so yeah, these are a few of the tools that uh, are under this umbrella of MISP project. Uh, but in addition to the tools, we also have what we call intelligence and knowledge base. So it's basically um, all classification, libraries uh, uh, of contextualization that is available to everyone. So even though it's prefixed with a, a MISP in front of it, it's because it's used by the MISP application, but this uh, knowledge base can be used in other tools. So we know already many tools that are using these uh, as just like a classification mechanism. Uh, if you are not really... If you don't really know what I'm talking about, you will see later on when, when you will see that in action in MISP. And the tool as Pilar, which are the open standard, because MISP is a tool, but MISP is also a format. So we describe that uh, in part uh, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in a draft, internet draft. And last but not least, the last Pilar, intelligence and sharing community. So we produce various compliance documents, uh, such as uh, legal document for example, GDPR. I didn't talk about it in the previous slide about sharing difficulties, but uh, this is also, if you have some legal restriction in sharing information, you can have a look at this uh, URL that is in, in the bottom of the slide. We have compiled a lot of documents that can help you in that aspect. Um, but we also provide feeds that you can uh, ingest directly once you install a MISP instance so that you can get started right away with data. And uh, yeah, some best practices, training materials and training like we are doing today. So sharing MISP, we will see that in practice because slides are good, but uh, it's not really telling on how it works behind the scenes. Uh, there are many ways in MISP to share information. You can share them to like various communities at once, specific uh, communities, even specific uh, list of organization. Uh, you, you can have what we call pseudo-anonymized information sharing that allows you to create data, uh, but do not leak your name or the name of the company, of your company. You also have a way to collaborate on information sharing. So if you notice that someone did a mistake or a typo, you can propose changes. You can also improve data created by others. Um, yeah, a lot of very interesting things that we'll see in details. Um, all about sharing again, synchronization, the feed system, air gap sharing that I've mentioned already. And uh, last but not least that I will mention on this slide is um, the quick lookup on feeds. Because sometimes you have huge feeds that you don't want to ingest in your system as is uh, because of space constraint or for performance reason. Um, but MISP has a system that allows you to partially ingest a feed in a fast uh, lookup store. Uh, we call that process caching. Um, and it's a way for you to see that a specific piece of data exists in a feed or in, an, in another large data set. Um, so when you are in the interface or using DPA, you see that this information is already known or is part of that uh, particular large data set. And so you can dig into that data set and learn more later on without the need to like downloading and uh, feeding your uh, database with that information. All right, so we talk about sharing. Uh, that means you will get information from third parties. Uh, and that's where information quality management comes into play. Because if you receive information from 
third parties or for people you don't really know, you want to make sure that it, it is information that you can actually use in your system, right? And so MISP has a lot of different tools to help you with that. Um, so we have data correlation that we'll see. Um, you have the, the sightings that I haven't mentioned, but I've mentioned the principle. So sightings allows you to, to tell someone that a specific piece of data is a false positive or the other way around, that it's actually something that they saw in their network. And so it's a highly relevant uh, piece of information. We have also the warning list system that helps you do some trials on typical false positive uh, that you might encounter in your system. And all the CTI uh, uh, pipeline, uh, like curation pipeline, uh, that that you can run using the different tools that we have in the MIS project, it's like the MIS module for doing enrichment, the workflow system to process and control information. Um, yeah, a lot of it's really interesting stuff. All right, so that being said, uh, I think that's enough for introduction for slides. Uh, I think it's, uh, I prefer to, to show stuff live. So what I will do is I will use the training instance that we have all at our disposal. So feel free to, to join and look around on that instance if you want. So you can use this uh, training, miscommunity.org. I'll just... All right. And I'm just logged in the instance. And let's see what we have. So we'll quickly run you through the interface, what stuff means and so on. All right, so as soon as you are logged in, you end up in this uh, interface that shows you the list of events that you have on your instance. So as it is a training instance, we don't have much data in there. Uh, it is uh, on purpose uh, so that we don't flood you with uh, information. But basically, you have like the different events that uh, have been encoded so far in this instance. So one of them, the first one, we can see that we have uh, an event that is called GRU Close Access Cyber Operation against OPCW. We have another event called Ransomware Attack uh, against a French organization. Um, we have an investigation Syrian Electronic Army Activities Domain taken takeover via Melbourne IT Register. Uh, and another event about like uh, some threats to high performance computing infrastructure. So you see, we can have like a very broad type of events in, in MISP. So these were just the title of the event, uh, but you see more information. You can see who created that event. So in this case, it's Circle. So it's my organization who is the creator of that event. Um, and you can see a bit of context. Uh, as part of cluster and as part of tags. We'll see that what that means later on. But you will quickly understand what it is about. So a cluster, you see that the target is the Netherlands and the country, a country is involved and it's Russia. And we can see that right now the state of that event is in draft and we have some classification, some TLP classification. Um, if we have a look at another one, Let's say this one. So we have a thread actor. Uh, we know also some attack patterns. If you are familiar with Matri attack, you can recognize the technique. Also a TLP classification and another uh, tag that says that uh, this is domain abuse uh, and it's compromised domain name register. Okay. So that's not too bad. And then we have more information, some more meta information. We have who created it. Like in this case, it's always Alexandre. Uh, the dates at which it was created and the distribution level. We'll come back to distribution later on. So let's have a look at one of these events and to see what it actually looks like. So let's take the last one, the Cobalos Linux threat. We'll take others so that you have a feeling of what it is, what an event in this space. So if we click on the small eye, you're basically viewing that event. And at the top, 
we see like what we were, were seeing in the previous screen, basically meta information that are related to that event. So once again, the title, who created the data, some tags for the context, the distribution level, some warnings. We have some warnings that needs to be addressed. More context as part of galaxies. So we have the sector that are being uh, affected by this threat, uh, the region that are being affected by this threat. And once again, mitra attack patterns uh, with the techniques that are being used uh, by this uh, malware. Then if, if we scroll down, we can see an event report. So an event report is basically just a report. And if we click on it, we have a report. Oh, it's nothing that uh, that's fancy. It's just a, a report that des that describes what this thread is about. Um, we have some pictures and so on. It's uh, it's it's basically a report. <laughs> and then the the interesting things when it comes to blocking and detect detecting your network infrastructure the actual data that belongs to that event. Um, so in this case, we have a file or where we have the, the SHA-1 of that file. That is uh, um, the SHA-1 compiled from that uh, malware that has been compiled for hell. We have the same one that has been compiled for Debian and one for Ubuntu and more information. So we some ports, we have some uh, antivirus detections, we have an IP port, and we even have a Yahoo. Okay, so let's have a look at that, another event. Let's take um, this one, ransomware attack against a French organization. So once again, we have a bit of uh, context as part of tags and galaxies. And then we have an object um, which is the link. So this is the link of the report uh, that was used to encode that information. And then we have some like Twitter IDs, URLs, MD5, SHA-1. So now to talk a bit about terminology. This is an event. This, the initial page that we landed on when we logged in, it's a list of events, so it's also the event index. And you you realize now that events contains tables, so that big table, uh, which contains data. Each row of that table, we call them attributes. So you can see how attribute can take many forms. They can be a URL, they can be a file hash, md5, sha1, sha2256. Uh, uh, even Bitcoin wallets. And in this table, we also have some specific kind of highlighting with that blue box. And this one, we call them objects. So objects are basically a combination of multiple attributes that make sense together. So to come back to the Cobalos one, we have a file object. You can see for the file object, we have the, the file name and a hash for that file. Well, let's see if we have other examples. This one, we have a vulnerability object. So we have the vulnerability ID, a small summary, the state of that vulnerability and references. We even have a device object that describes a device. So in this case, we know that it's an, an ATM and we even know the OS of that ATM. So it's quite cool. So you see, we have basically attributes that are like basic building blocks or basic simple data points. And these attributes can be combined into a higher level concept, which we call object. Object that describes a concept, for example, vulnerability, a file, uh, a URL. And, and this concept contains multiple attributes. Okay, so now that we know about these basic things, uh, I think it's a good moment to see how you can use the system to actually create data. So what we will do, 
is we'll use one of the example I have here. So this is uh, an encoding exercise. So it's a fake uh, incident uh, that we use to basically show or give us an example or hands on uh, on how to use MISP to encode various things. And today uh, I choose to do the encoding of a scam call uh, that involves money transfer. So we have a bit of narrative there. So we quickly go through so that everyone is on the same page. So the, the story behind that fake incident is that a victim was called by a scammer called Wallace Brain. Uh, and Wallace Brain used a phone number, which is there. And our friend Wallace pretended to be a Microsoft employee. And he managed to convince the victim uh, that he could help the victim by using uh, RDP, so remote, remote desktop assistance. So once Wallace had access to the system, he downloaded a binary from the URL provided there. He installed that binary. And we suppose that, uh, so he didn't do anything once he installed it, but we suppose it's is there as a backdoor so that he can uh, access the computer of the victim later on. And once the installation was done, he told the victim that everything is uh, in order, everything is... Uh, uh, working as intended, uh, but then he, the victim had to pay for the technical assistance. And so he, uh, he gave uh, his bank account to the victim so that, uh, the victim would transfer the money to that bank account. And the day after the victim suspecting it was a scam contacted the police. So that's basically the narrative of that fake incident. So based on that, we collected some evidence, we extracted some, some data from this evidence, for example, the scammer IP address, the actual binary, the URL that was used to download the, the binary, the bank account, the phone number, and so on. So these are the extracted value from the evidences. So we see we have an IP address, we have the binary, uh, we have an URL, we have an IBAN number, uh, phone number, and the name of the suspected scammer. All right, so now we'll see how you can turn this incident and this information into a MISP event that can be uh, that can be shared with the community so that they know about this specific indicator of compromise and they can protect their constituency uh, with that information. So if you if you are willing to do the same exercise as I'm doing, uh, you can just open up open the the exercise, it's linked in the Edge document, Edge doc doc document. So you have to scroll down in the detailed agenda and you can click on this one. Um, or you can just follow along while I'm doing the encoding myself. Okay. So we have that IP address. And now I I want to encode this IP address in this, but how would I do it? Well, Based on the previous screen that I showed you, uh, you may have noticed that attributes, they always belong in an event. So you cannot have a, an attribute not being part of an event. So the first thing that you have to do is to actually create an event in MISP. So for that, I will just click on the add event button that I have on the left sidebar. Then we have this really small form that we can use to create our event. So I can put a date, I can put the distribution. We'll come back to the dis distribution later on. Right now, we'll just pick the distribution, your organization only, so that only the user that belongs to my organization can view the data. Then I can assess the travel of that event. Uh, so is it high, is it low? In my opinion, it's a very classic uh, scam uh, that looks like not really well done, so I will just use low. And I can also describe the analysis, so at which state in the analysis are we for that event. So is it the initial, is it ongoing, or is it completed? Uh, let's say that it's ongoing for now. So just one small note regarding these two fields, thread level and analysis. So you can see that we don't have many options for which we can choose. 
Um, this is because these fields are very old. So they were introduced, I don't know, back in 2012, perhaps. I wasn't even working on this at that time. So these fields are legacy fields that are still used by some communities. But nowadays, they are superseded by other uh, contextualization uh, libraries, namely taxonomies, which we'll see later on. Uh, but so we can we can use them, uh, but we recommend people to be more precise on the trend and analysis using these uh, taxonomies. And then last field that we have to uh, to fill is the event info. So event info, also called event title, it's basically a really short description um, that explains what this event is about or what this incident is about. Because an event, it can be various things. An event can be like an incident, the same as we are encoding right now. An event can be like a blog post that you saw on the web and you are encoding. An event can be a daily dump of malicious URLs or malicious uh, hash files. Uh, file hash, sorry. Um, so yeah, it can be a lot of different things. We call it event and not incident because it can take many forms and especially that uh, incident has a a bad connotation that uh, something bad happened. So that's the historical reason. So for this title, event title, I will use, uh, let's say, something like successful cam call. Uh, and then I submit. And there we go. I have my event created. So something that uh, you might notice is the create organization is no longer circle as it used to be for the other events. It is org name. Org name is the organization, like the test organization I created for my user, which I should have changed. Um, but yeah, if I'm looking at the index, now I can see that three of you created an event and the organization of your user is called org main. So that's why the create organization has been set correctly to your organization. So that was just a side note. All right, so I have created my event. Uh, you can see that it's completely empty because we are still, uh, uh, we still need to, to actually add information. And you can see the warning that right now our event has no attributes, it has an, no object uh, and no context at all. So. The system tells us, okay, maybe it's time to add information to that event. And don't worry, we'll do it right now. So first thing that we can encode is that IP address. Okay. So we'll just copy that IP address and I will add it as an attribute. So to add an attribute, we can either click on this add attribute button. So the plus button close to the table or on the sidebar, you have an add attribute uh, link that you can click. So if I click on there, I have this huge value text area. I will just paste the value. And then I need to choose a category and a type. So category, we have a um, defined set of categories that you can use. So we have like targeting data, internal reference, payload delivery, payload installation, network activity. So you have to, to select which type of category this attribute is about. So this is just the log, the, the IP address collected from the log file of the, the, the scammer. So I will just take the talk activity. And finally, you have to choose the correct type of that uh, for that value. So you have like IP source, IP desk, host name, domain, URLs, user region. So you have many different types that you can choose from. Uh, in this case, it's clearly not a domain, it's just an IP. So I will take uh, IP source. Distribution, we'll see that later on. Uh, but just a hint right now. You can set the distribution for the event, but you can also set the distribution for an attribute, for an individual attribute, so that you can really be very selective on what you want to share and to whom you want to share. But we'll see that later on. Then we have a contextual comment field. Uh, it's just a way for you to like attach a small comment 
uh, to that attribute. So I could say that this is I collected from block file. Or I can even say IP. It's the IP address of the scanner. All right. We'll skip all the other fields, but this one. The for intrusion detection system that has an alias, it's called 2IDS. Um, basically, this field allows you to, to tell uh, users and the API of MISP if does this is this attribute supposed to be fed to protective tool? Is this attribute meant for intrusion detection system? So in another way to see it is if you are familiar with uh, with Tix, uh, Tix has a concept of uh, indicator of compromise and observable. So you could say that uh, if the checkbox box is checked, that means that it is an IOC, so an indicator of compromise. If it's not checked, uh, this is uh, an observable. All right. So in this case, this kind of IP address uh, if we decide that this is malicious IP address and we want to block it in our net for infrastructure, we make to make we have to make sure that this checkbox is checked. We'll come back to that multiple times during this encoding. So you click submit, then the system tells you the attribute has been saved, and if you scroll down, you can see your attribute in the table. Perfect. So next step is to encode this malicious binary that was installed on the victim's computer. So we'll just download it quickly. Okay. And so to add that malicious binary, we don't go through the add attributes form. Now this time we go through the add attachment. So I will click on add attachment. You can see the form is way smaller. So I can just, that used to work. So choose file. All right. So I can choose the category. Is it not average detection? Is it the payload delivery? Is it the payload installation? So you can choose the category. Once again, you can choose the distribution level. And you can add a comment similar to what we did last time. So I could say this comment. And last but not least, we have to tell the system if this binary or file, rather, is it a malware sample or not? Because you could add an attachment that could be, for example, a PDF report. And in this case, a PDF report is not a malware sample. So if you choose to disable that option, uh, MISP will just create uh, create the file and save the file access. If you tell MISP that this is a malware sample, MISP will do multiple things. So MISP will save it. It will uh, automatically compute the different file hashes so that you don't have to manually, you know, compute the SHA-1, the MD5, and so on of that file. No, no, you just, uh, just, let, MISP, you just let MISP do that job. And finally, it will also uh, encrypt that file on disk so that if someone by mistake downloads it, it doesn't get run automatically. So people will have to uh, uh, provide the decryption password to open up the archive. So this is a malicious, um, a malicious malware sample. So I will I'll make sure that this checkbox is ticked. I click on upload. Then this tells me that it has been uploaded. And if we scroll down, we can see that we have the file object that has been created. We have the file name. We have all the different file hashes that have been computed automatically by MISP. And we have the malware sample. All right, so if I click on this one, MISP may tell me that I'm about to download a file that is probably a malware. That for my safety, the file has been compressed uh, and it's encrypted, and to decrypt the file, I have to use the password infected. So it couldn't be more straightforward. 
Okay, so now I have added my file. Great. Now let's go to the next one, which is an URL. So we have that URL. So what I could do is I could create an attribute of type URL. But if I would do that, I would lose some benefits of using another uh, entity to store that information. And I will explain you why. So instead of using an attribute, I will use an object. Because in that URL, we have many components that we can explode and use. For example, we have the domain. We have uh, well the full URL, of course. We also have the path, like the resource path that is being used uh, in that URL. And these different components of that URL are valuable information that we want to split from the original URL. So what I will do this time is I will create an object. So just notice the difference. When I created an attribute, uh, well, it was created as a single row. When I added the attachment, this automatically created that file for me. But now I will create an object manually. So I will click on Add Object. And then I have to choose in which category the object I want to use is in. So to be fair, I never know in which category they are. Uh, they are probably in network, but as I never know, I always pick all objects. Then I open this up and I search for what I want to encode. So in this case, it's a URL. So I just type URL and the picker selects and show me directly the object. So I click on URL and then I end up in this form. We'll make it full screen so that you see what it looks like. So you see it's again a huge form. Uh, and if we look more closely, we can see the different component that we can encode for that URL object. So we can have an URL, we can have the domain, the domain with a TLD, an IP address if we have one, the query string, the resource path of that URL, the scheme uh, that is being used for that uh, URL. So we have many options. But we don't have to encode everything, thankfully. The only thing that we need to make sure has been uh, encoded is one of these two. So either the URL or the resource path. Is if one of these two are valid in that form, then MISP will allow me to create that object. So let's do it easy. Let's just put the URL like this. But then we have other stuff. We have the domain. And given the fact that it's a, an interesting domain, uh, I think we can just make sure that it, it's uh, it's part of the object as well. Um, we don't have an IP address, but we have a query string. There we go. Uh, the schema could put, I could use HTTPS. So you might be wondering, is it really worth it to, to have the query string and to encode it like this? Well, this one is not that interesting, but if you would have something very obscure, like convoluted, something like this, or even a binary that would have a really specific uh, name, Sometimes it's it's quite useful to have this information encoded, especially for correlation purposes. We'll see more um, about correlation later. So now I'm quite happy with what I have, so I can just click Submit. I get this view that is basically a summary of what I'm about to save. And this is looking good, so actually I can just create my object. This tells me that the object has been saved and I can see now my object. This is quite cool. Okay, great. So what else do we have? We have an IBAN number. And in addition to that IBAN number, we can see we have other stuff. We have the Swift, uh, we have the account number, we have the currency. So we could create one attribute for each of these components. I mean, we have an object that can group them together. So let's just use that, right? So once again, add object, all object, and then it's bank account. There we go. So bank account, once again, we have many fields that we can use. And in this case, well, um, the Swift. I have the Swift there. The IBAN number, I can paste it there. What else do we have? 
account number. Put it there, currency. This is interesting. So you can see we have some same value that are provided by default by the tool, so USD and Euro. But the system allows us to be like more free. So in this case, the currency GBP. So I can just click on enter value manually and pay it based the, the currency that I want to use there. Okay, so I could even put the balance, but we don't know about that. So this looks good. But something that I can also talk about is again the distribution. So this, uh, so you saw Evan can have a distribution, attribute can have a distribution, but object can also have a distribution. Uh, and for this one, I will make sure to pick your organization only for this object. So that if by any chance I were to change the distribution of my event, the distribution of that object will always stay your organization only. Because it used to be any rate event, so basically no distribution. But now if I change the distribution of my event, the distribution of that object will stay your organization only. Because uh, bank accounts, uh, I mean, this is, uh, this is this can be considered as really sensitive information that you don't necessarily want to share with other companies or partners. So in this case, I'm making sure that even if I make the distribution level of my event more lax so that more people can see it, at least my bank account object will have very strict distribution level. So I can click on submit. <laughs> then I can quickly review what I'm about to save. This looks very good. I click on create new object. And there we go. We have our bank account. And what's more, we can see that we have a small sign there. And this tells us that mm, this is warning. This doesn't seem to be a legitimate big value. So we haven't talked about validation yet. But if you try to save like, let's let's try. Let's try to save an IP address that looks like this. As expected, Miss doesn't allow me to do that because this is not a valid IP address, right? So in, in, in Miss validation is quite strict for some type, but not for all. For example, this Swift, MISP knows or thinks that this is not a legitimate format for a Swift or for a big value. But for this format, for this type, MISP still allows you to save, uh, to save it as is. Uh, the main reason is for some types, uh, sometimes attacker used uh, like badly formatted stuff to, to exploit uh, some tools and so on. So sometimes it really makes sense um, to, to allow for uh, this kind of uh, lax validation. But for other like type such as an IP address, I mean, an IP address, it has to be valid IP address, right? So that's why we have these two type of validation. All right, moving on. We have two more stuff to encode. Phone number. So phone number, we we'll quickly notice that I love to create object because creating object offer you more flexibility, as we'll see later on. Uh, so, so in, in this case, um, typically, I see phone. Um, I could regard it as phone, but I mean, I cannot really add it as is because it's not really a phone number. So I will show you another way to do th to do things. So in this case, uh, phone number, this is used for financial fraud, right? I you can just put the phone number, the plus. Uh, I could even say that this should be fed to protective tool. So if you are in the cyber world uh, uh, with IDS system, this doesn't mean anything for you to, to have a phone number as to IDS system. But if you are a telecom operator and you know that this phone number is doing something like SS7 attacks or stuff like this, uh, well, it makes sense to, to have the distinction between the observable and IOCs. All right. 
just combine it. All right, and I will show you the, the small trick. Uh, because sometimes um, when you create attributes, you realize that maybe these two attributes they actually belong together. So like if you would have created the URL and the domain as attribute, as individual attribute, you might think later on, or oh, maybe these two attributes actually are an object. So I want to combine them into an object. And that you can do in MISP. So you just select all the attributes you want to combine. Scroll up. You click on this group selected attribute into an object. And then MISP will show you all the possible choices that you can choose from. In this case, I could say that the IP, this IP that I want to, to convert it to an object is actually an IP port. I'll just click on IP port. Click on merge above attribute into an object. And you can see now I've converted my single attribute into an object. And if I edit that object, I can add more stuff. So now if I know about like the port of that IP, um, where is it? That's the port. I could add, for example, the port. So this is a, a small trick. Um, and it comes very well. It, or at least it's used quite a lot when you use the free text import tool. And you know what? Let's use it right now so that you see what I'm talking about. So let's just take this whole blob of text. And let's click on that small button, populate using the free text import tool. If you paste it like this and you click on submit, MISP will try to parse that whole, that whole um, text and convert it into uh, some attribute that he detects. So in this case, it detected correctly the phone number, the URL, and even the binary that is used. But you can see, for example, the bank account MISP doesn't know uh, how to properly convert that into like a bank account object. So this is also a quick way for you to do encoding. So to just take a blob of text, use a free te text import tool. And then if you click on submit attribute, I won't do it because I already have them in my event. But if you were to do it, you would have three, three individual attributes in your event. And afterwards, once you have them, you can start to combine them into object by selecting them manually and clicking on this group, selected attribute into object. So that's also another way to do the encoding rather than doing what I've been doing right now, which is manually copy pasting stuff in the correct form. Okay, last but not least, so that we are done with that uh, incident, we have our friend Wallace uh, that we still need to encode. Um, someone is asking to, to do it again. Can you take it again? Ah, okay. Um, to do the, okay, uh, sure. So you can just take the IP, can encode the IP once again. Make sure that this, I know that this IP is my issue, so I make sure to check that checkbox. So take uh, one IP source, boom. So what you do, you just select the attribute that you want to convert or multiple attributes that you want to convert. You click on this group selected attribute into an object, I will zoom in so that you can see the icon. So by the way, you can see the, the glory of, of MISP being zoomed in. Um, so click on this button, and then it shows you a list of compatible objects that can be converted. No, well, compatible object for which that attribute can be converted. And so in this case, I could take uh, the IP port that I used. Then it shows me that I'm about to merge that attribute into an object, click on merged, and that's it, I have it. Okay, I will just delete it so that I don't have duplication. Okay, now that I'm um, looking at it in the chat, I see that uh, people are wondering uh, about accessing this uh, training MISP instance. So once again, um, if you go on the edge document, edge doc document for that training, you have the link to the MISP training instance with the different with the credential. So basically, you take 
one of the users between one and 100. So in this case, for example, I used user 12. And you can use the password misp underscore training underscore October. All right. So last but not least, our friend Wallace. So I will add an object. And I want to encode a person. So you can see we have two results. We have ftm-person. This is maybe what we are looking for, but let's see what, what else is there. We have impersonation. Hmm. If we had some impersonation going on, this could be interesting. Um, we have person, what we are looking for actually, and personification. So in our case, we have person and FTM person. So if you don't know what which one to pick, just click on the first one, check what the object is about. So it's FTM person. What is FTM? FTM is part of the follow the money. So I don't think it's... Uh, quite what we are looking for. So let's take the other object and see what we have instead. Person is an object which describes the person as or an identity. This is what we are looking for. And what requirement do we have for that object is simply one of, either one of these. So the first name, the last name, the full name, or an alias. Or well, it's quite easy. We have the first and last name. And let's put first. Um, what else can we encode there? Portrait the phone number. We could even put the phone number. If you are sure that this phone number is actually uh, the one of uh, Wallace, we could put it there. Um, any stuff? More roles? We could say that this is a culprit. <laughs> Um, so you can see, you can encode a lot of information like passport number, date of birth, gender, and so on. Or even the nationality, let's say, GB. Click on Submit. And actually, I, I realized that I just did a small mistake. This information, we um, might not want to share it with us, like everyone, like partners and so on. So what I want to do is to make sure that this stays under... Oops. Ah, this is a small bug that needs to be fixed. So you see, even when you do stuff live, stuff happens. That's because the checkbox when I click on back didn't automatically like reject itself. Okay, now we are good. This is looking very good. Can click on create. And there we go. So we've encoded all the information. Hmm? Okay. But there's potentially more that we can do with that, right? Because now, sure, we have we have this. We can like start to export what can be used to be fed to our predictive tool. Uh, but I mean, we are still missing something, which is, uh, as I saw in, in the chat, uh, by uh, the Alex reply is the relationship between all of these. So for example, we could uh, say that, okay, um, this person, Wallace, is the owner of that phone number or this person is the owner of that bank account or that this person asked for that malware to be downloaded and the fact that that malware was downloaded from that location. So there are two ways for us to encode this information. First one would be to create a report, right? So we can click on event report. You click on add event report. You give it a name, like, uh, like I don't know, uh, scam call incident. You just take the narrative. Oh, come on. Copy, paste. Submit. And now we have it. So we have our report and anyone that is interesting, interested in what this event is about can just read the report. But you can also encode it in a way that can be used um, in an automated way so that you would have what we call 
a relationship graph that would show the relationship between the different entities and different objects that we have in there. So instead of clicking on event report, this time we will click on event graph. So right now, we don't have much. We have an attribute that is being unreferenced, and we have five objects that are still unreferenced. So basically, one, two, three, four, five, our five objects, and the attribute that is uh, alone there. So how can you use that graph? Um, it's an interactive graph on which you can like expand and collapse nodes. So in this one, if you want to see all the attributes that are being unreferenced, I can just press the X key. I will, it will show me the attributes. If I want to collapse it, I can press the C key. Um, and I can do the same for the object. So if I select this node, I press the X key and I see all the object. Then I can start to add relationship. And in this, there are two ways to add relationship. There is the boring way to do it, just using the plus button that we have there, add reference. It creates you like this form where you can choose the relationship type and the target because we've picked the source of the relationship, so person. And then I can pick, choose a target. So I can say, for example, that this phone number belongs to, right? So is, is it that, that way actually? Uh, no, it would be the other way around. So it would be the phone number belongs to that person. Uh, but what I can do is the other way around. So what's the opposite of belongs to? It could be owner of or own. So in my case now, Wallace is the, owns the phone number. And what I have, you can see automatically, my graph was created and I have my person and it says that this person owns that phone number. So you saw the boring way to do it. Now you have the fun way to do it, is to do it directly from that graph. So we know that uh, Wallace is the owner of that phone number, but we also know that he is the owner of that bank account, most probably. So you click on edit, add reference. You click on the first uh, node, so the source node. You drag it onto the target node. Automatically, it prefills the target UID so that it's picked correctly. And now you can add the relationship type. Um, so in this case, it's owner of. All right. So what else do we have? Let's see. We have that payload, and we know that that payload was downloaded from uh, that URL, right? So what you can do is simply ah, use the shortcut. So instead of clicking on edit and add relationship, I can press the shift key and you see it switches into the quick add mode. So if I press switch, uh, shift, and then I can quickly drag and drop. So in this case, we know that that malware was downloaded from. And that's it. Hmm? It's starting to look like something uh, with all the relationship, we couldn't even say that this um, um, this uh, binary was installed by, uh, or I can say that Brain, like uh, Wallace, uh, installed that file. So I could click something like this. Ah, interesting. So we don't have install as a keyword. Oh, what do I do? Am I stuck? Not at all. So even though we prefer people to use the predefined vocabularies that we have there. If you are missing something, you can always add it. So to add it, you have to know the trick. You select custom, and then you have this entry that is revealed on which you can add whatever you want. So in this case, I can just say, my installed. There we go or install either, so that it's present for. Okay. What's left? We have an IP port. Um, this uh, IP port, um, well, it was the IP of, uh, of Wallace. 
Um, so you could also add the relationship between the two. Okay. Oops, just checking quickly. Okay. So that's a pretty good event. Uh, we have a report, we have uh, the event graph. Uh, it's not too bad. But now we are still missing something, right? If I go back on the index and I look at my event, this is my event and this is previous event. And what you immediately see is we are missing context. We are missing a lot of context. So it's always good to add context. First of all, so that when you are browsing that list of events, you immediately know uh, what this is about uh, and if it's interesting to you. And most importantly, in my opinion, if you are using like automated tools or exporting information or even better, automated export, you can filter the data you want to export and the data you don't want to export. So that's why what we will do. We'll add a bit of context. So what can we add as context? Um, well, first we could add classification about who can view the data and who can um, talk about it and how it should be done. So for that, if you're not familiar with TLP, so TLP is a, like, it's called TLP for Traffic Light Protocol. And it's basically um, a classification uh, that facilitates the understanding of uh, who can view the data and how it can be shared. Uh, for example, if we take the two extreme, TLP reds, it's basically for the eyes and ear of individual recipient only, no further disclosure. And we have the other extreme of the spectrum, TLP white, also called TLP clear, um, which means that this information can be publicly shared. So we can put it on the internet and whatnot. So in our case, um, we'll add, oops, we'll add a TLP classification. So to do that, we click on this small globe icon to add a tag. And then you have to select um, a taxonomy. Uh, so we haven't talked about taxonomy yet. I will come to that uh, after the break. Uh, but basically, these are lists uh, of tags. So if you want to add a tag from the TLP taxonomy, we just, uh, we just click on the TLP there. And then we can choose the tag. So in this case, let's pick TLP green. TLP green, which is limited disclosure. A recipient can spread this within their community. So this is, seems like a good fit for us. Um, what else can we use? Um, we could specify the type of attack that is being used in that event. Uh, so in this case, it's some social engineering. But I believe this is not active. So please ignore what I'm going to do for the next 10 seconds. Um, I believe this is this one. Okay. We'll see all of that tomorrow during the administration part. Okay, now I can use, sorry. Uh, social engineering attack vector. And this is clearly a case of phishing, right? And uh, what else? Spam email? No, delegating. Technical expert. Ah, this is this is good. So with that, we know that someone pretends to be a technical expert and we have some phishing in place. Okay. Uh, so we could even go further uh, crazy. We could say... Uh, uh, all the, the techniques that were involved and so on. Uh, but I just don't have the taxonomy enabled. I will just keep this part to make it short. Um, but what we can also do is to add the, um, the attack pattern that were used for that specific attack. So in this case, I will just use... We have a lot to choose from. Um... 
So, where is it? This has changed. So I'm not really familiar with that in interface. Um, also, if you are really familiar with Mitre attack, you really might recognize that with all the Kinshale and, and so on. Uh, this is the new version, which I'm not really familiar with. So I'm not sure where the technique I'm, I'm looking for is located in. So I'll use the old trick of just seeing everything and then picking from the list. So uh, what we are dealing with uh, is some kind of um, user doing the manipulation themselves. Uh, so we have something, I don't remember exactly the name. Ah, user execution, that's it. So the user executes the operation itself. Um, do we have something like uh, wishing maybe or RDP? RDP check, and that's not really it. Uh, we also have some cone logs involved. That was uh, how the IP of the attacker uh, uh, was, was used and so on. So we could add this. Um, so yeah, the more you know about uh, about the, the context and the technique that were used by the attacker, the, the more complete you can make that list. And uh, it's not too bad. Okay, so it's checking. This is good. This is good. Okay, just one last thing. So I showed you how you can quickly encode information using the free text import tool. Remember this one, where you just type some uh, text and then it tries to do the extraction automatically. But for specific type of data, it's worth uh, using another method. For example, the URL. The URL, you remember this one, I had to split it and it can be very time consuming to do it by hand. Um, so if you are in a situation where you frequently encode URLs, you can use an import uh, module for that. If you click on, if you click on the populate from uh, button on the sidebar, you can use various tools to import information. For example, you could import data coming from another MISP event, you could use the free text import tool, the one that we just used where you just paste a blob of text. Um, you can use uh, data coming from the open IOC uh, format, thread connect format. You could even import from a CSV. But what I wanted to show you is the URL import. So we have a specific uh, import module for importing URLs. So if you can just paste a list of uh, URLs, or just take this one, for example, and I will make even more complex with some query. Oh, doesn't really matter. Um, yeah, you click on import. And what is going on is behind the scenes, MISP will query uh, the MISP modules that are running. Um, and ask the MISP module to explode the URL and to create an object out of it for us. So the first one is the URL I pasted from, from my exercise, this one. You can see that it created the URL, it extracted the TLD, took the subdomain, took the host, extracted the resource path, and so on. And the second object is the second uh, entry that I pasted, where I just took the URL of my uh, uh, of my of the demo instance and he did the same so you see we have also the resource path and we have the query string that is being extracted correctly so in this uh, in this case i can choose what i want to save so let's say that i don't want to save the first object i want to save this one but i don't want to keep the tld i don't want to keep the domain without tld and i don't want to keep the subdomain and with that i'm quite happy with it so i click submit this is being done in the background, so I have to wait a few seconds before reloading. And once I reload, I can see my full object. So it's really worth it if you're encoding a lot of URLs to like manually do 
the encoding uh, using the uh, populate from URL import. And tomorrow we will see how you can, for those who are interested, you will see how you can create such kind of import modules. Because this uh, import module for the for the URL, this is something that can be done, like implemented really quickly. Uh, I remember when I did it, it was like two years ago. It was during a training and uh, we implemented it with the attendees in like 30 minutes. So if you are including a lot of URLs, I think it's really worth investing the time to implement such kind of uh, import modules to simplify your life. I'll just remove that quickly. And now what I can do, I can explore my events and learn more about it. Just because uh, many of you, like one, two, three, four, five, five of you created events that contain the same information as mine. So we can see at the top, we have related events. These are created, like these related events, MISP knows about them because of the concept of correlations. So we can see different, the different events, scam call, scam, scam call, and so on. And if we scroll down, we can see what is actually correlating between my event and yours. So event 61 and 62 has this information. So if we click on this one, we can see now that this is the event one of you created. So it's user 67 that created that event. And if I scroll down, I can see, oh, okay, this, uh, this user also encoded the URL, uh, also encoded the person. And then finally we can see the data that correlates with mine. So if I go back to my old, uh, to my event, I can, for example, see the hash file and I can see that three of you also added the binary. The IP address, I can see that four of you added it. So correlation, really nice to see uh, data that is present in another event. By data, I mean attributes, because only attributes correlate. We even have a graph for that. If you don't have too many correlations, it's useful. If you have way too much correlation, it can be quite a mess. Uh, but now, I mean, you can quickly see everything if I just explode the view so on the edge I have all the events with my events there on the right side and at the center we can see all the attributes that correlates with all other events so basically all these attributes exist as you can see with the highlighting exist in these other events this is quite cool to see cluster of information. Okay. Um, just checking. Seems like most of the things have been covered. So one last thing before we go to the break um, is about publication. Something about changing that. Anyway. Okay, so once you have created your data, like the different attributes, the different objects, and of course, once you have contextualized your information so that everyone can quickly see uh, if it's relevant for them or not, it's time for you to first review the distribution level. So to make sure that the recipient, like the, the, per, the person for which you want this event to be visible is correctly assigned. Uh, so you review the distribution. And once that's done, you have to publish it. So publishing, you can view it like sending an email, basically. And actually, that's what's happening behind the scene as well. So when you publish an event, you make it in a state where it's marked to everyone that this event can be consumed. Or at least the data that is within that event can be consumed. It doesn't mean that the event is finished or that the analysis is done. No, not at all. It just means that this is ready to be consumed. 
And it also signal to MISP that this information, so this event, can be shared to other MISP instances. So when I click on publish, we just use a different one. Let's say all communities. We'll go about different distribution level after the break. Basically, all communities means unrestricted sharing, more or less. So if I click on publish event, I can see that some servers are connected to this one. So this one, this two, three, and four, these servers are connected to my training instance and the event will be pushed to these servers. So if I click on yes, now the job has been queued. The event is, in, is being published. Finally, now I can see that my event is published. We can see the publish time. So, and this, this event has been sent to these four MISP instances. All right. So, but that's not only the only thing that happened. In addition to that, we also sent notification email to any users that have access to that instance. So for that training instance, emailing is disabled to avoid spamming. But on the production instance, you would send notification email to any users that have subscribed to notification emails to tell them a new event has been created. If you were to do a change, like uh, fix a typo, let's say that in the end, this phone number is not considered as a to be fed to protective tool. So we want to turn off the IDS flag. If I do a change on that event, we can see that now the event is not published anymore. Indicated with the, uh, with the, the red and bold font, it means that this information uh, has not been published yet. So it is pending publication to be propagated. And now I have to publish it again so that other MISP instance uh, will get the update. So I have the choice between publish event and publish no email. So if I do publish event, it will be the same thing as we did like uh, one minute ago, including sending email notification. And for that specific case, uh, we have to publish no email to avoid spamming. So if you just do uh, a small notification like this, there is no point in sending emails to everyone uh, having access to your instance. So by just doing a small publish, no email, the information has been propagated. Uh, other misp instance got the update uh, and we didn't uh, spam our users. All right, so now I think it's good time for a break. Um, after the break, we'll go into more advanced concepts. We'll see enrichment of information, uh, the usage of warning lists to reduce false positives. Um, and we'll do a small recap uh, and summary of the different concepts and terminology that we have in MISP. And after what we'll proceed in more general usage, including searches, uh, aggregating information, and a specific section about collaboration. So how you can use the different tools and features in MISP to correctly collaborate within a team, but also with other partners. And we'll close with best practices on encoding data. All right, so let's have a 15 minute break. So see you all in 15 minutes. All right, so welcome back to this, that small break. So we'll continue on our event um, and see some more concepts and features that you can use um, before going in the next section of the training. Okay, so for this one, I've created two new entries, um, just a small domain that is known to be a valid domain because this one was a fake domain, the one we had before. And just um, an IP address 8888. And by just entering this information, we can see that we have a huge warning box that says that we have potential false positive and that we have one of the attributes that says uh, that is part of a list of known IPv4 public DNS resolver. And this is marked with the small exclamation triangle there. Uh, so we can see that this IP address is 
part of that list. And as such, MISP warns us that this is, this is, <clears throat> that this is potentially a false positive. So the reason why we have this false positive is because we have checked the IDS flag, so the two IDS flag. So this flag, the one for intrusion detection system. So we've marked this IP address as being fed to our protective tools. And as MISP knows that this is potentially false positive, it warns us in the UI um, that we have potentially an issue. And the only thing that we have to do is to turn off the IDS flag and the warning disappears. Because right now we no longer consider that attribute as being like an IOC or to be fed to protective tool. And so there is no point in warning the user again. So something interesting for those who don't know, if you have this warning and you're exporting data via the API, you can ask Miss to remove any data that trips over warning list. So by just adding a specific flag in your API call, you can request MISP to get rid of any attributes that have a hit on the warning list. So that's quite, that's really nifty to have. Okay, the other one that I have added is that the circle.lu. And you can see that next to it, we have a magnifying glass. Um, but also, if you go on the right side, you can see that we also have this small asterisk. Uh, and if you click on it, it allows us to perform an enrichment on that attribute. So if I click on this one, I can choose which enrichment module I want to run on that specific attribute. For example, I could run the TNS module. This is a simple DNS expansion that resolves uh, the IP address for that domain. So if I click on this one, automatically uh, the IP address is being resolved. I can click on submit and now I have automatically created a new attribute and it said that it was enriched via the DNS module. So we have other modules. Uh, we have uh, country code, so we could expand the country code. Uh, so in this one, as this, it's a .lu domain, then it converted that attribute into uh, that, that one. Uh, and so, by clicking on this asterisk, what you actually do is you perform an enrichment. But once this enrichment has been done, MISP will save the result of that enrichment inside your event. In some cases, it doesn't really make sense to save the result. Sometimes you just want to see what it would be. So if we click on the magnifying glass, it will show the enrichment, but do not save them. So in this case, uh, on this 888, we can see uh, that the ASN enrichment module has been run and we have the, <coughs> the ASN number for that IP address. And the reverse DNS uh, module run again and it's reverse to dns.google. Uh, so what do we have? Another enrichment, empty result for this uh, binary. And this one Yara query creates for us um, a Yara rule that you could use. So it's, uh, it's quite nice. In this tr training instance, we don't have many enrichment modules, but uh, I mean, on production instance, you would have very useful enrichment modules such as, I don't know, virus total uh, and so on. Okay. So you can choose to manually run these enrichment on individual att attributes, but you can also run them on the whole event. So you have the option, if you click on enrich event, then you can choose all the enrichment uh, that should be run on your event. Click on enrich, and for all attributes that, that have a match on their uh, respective enrichment module, it will get run and the result will be saved in the event. Okay, so for the warning list, last thing that I want to show is how you actually manage these lists and what uh, what they look like. 
if you go on input filter and then warning list, you will see all the available warning lists uh, that are there by default when you install a MISP instance. So we have 86 on this instance. And the one that are enabled on this instance is, for example, the list of known URL shortener domain, um, the list of known IPv6 and IPv4 public DNS resolver. This is the one for which we got a hit. Um, one that is really useful is the list of known ashes for empty file. So basically, these are the ashes for empty files. Um, but yeah, you can enable much more than that. And something in terms of performance, if you're running a MISP instance, uh, you shouldn't be afraid to enable many warning lists because they are extremely cost efficient. And doing a lookup uh, using these warning lists is almost peanuts. Uh, it doesn't cost anything, basically. So we cannot recommend you enough to enable warning lists so that you can quickly see uh, any potential false positive that you might have when you're encoding events. Or even better, you can prevent uh, attributes that are marked as potential false positive to be exported uh, when you export your data to your protective tools. All right. So now that we've seen an introduction to the UI, the different concept and terminology, we'll go over a set of slides that explains a bit how data is structured. So it's a small summary of what we saw so far, but we'll dive more into details about the contextualization and the distribution. All right, so this is how uh, I like to, to view things. Um, where we have basically two layers in MISP. The first one is what I call the data layer. It's basically the layer that contains all the data that you will encode. For example, the events are in this layer, attributes, the object and the event reports, and much more on that layer. And the second layer is what I call the context layer. This is the layer on which you will add the context on the data layer. Um, and in MISP, Something that you have, well, I wanted to say to keep in mind, but something that is true is that any context that you would attach to your data layer is behind the scene, it's a tag. It's always a tag, but this tag, they can come from different sources. And you will see that when we go over the context layer part. But first, let's jump into the data layer with one of the data points that uh, we've been dealing with since the beginning, it's the attributes. So it's a quick reminder what that is. So you remember attribute, they can be an IP address, they can be a URL, uh, they can be a binary. And uh, yeah, you can differentiate an attribute uh, so that it could be either an indicator or supporting data, also called observable. Uh, and this state can be switched depending of the two IDS flags. So the flag that designates if an attribute should be fed to productive tools or not. Something that we have uh, on the top right of the, the attribute box, we have multiple icons. The first one with the tags, multiple tags means, or labels, means that you can attach context to this attribute. So you can attach a tag on attribute. And as it was uh, also asked in the chat as a question, uh, whether it is relevant sometime to add uh, attached tags to attributes, uh, it is very relevant. It really depends uh, on the on the type of data you are dealing with. Uh, but usually, as Alex mentioned, you would attach tags on the event, and any any attribute that belongs to that event inherit all the tags defined at the event level. So, to take back our case, we have attached TLP green on the event. That means any attributes within that event are implicitly tagged with TLP green. So when we try to export, like let's say I want to export all domain from my uh, uh, MISP instance with uh, domain being tagged with TLP green, even though this domain is not tagged, 
as the event is tagged with TLP green, the tag propagates to the attribute because they are inherently tagged uh, from the event. And so this attribute will be exported as well. But as Alex mentioned, in some cases, you want to be very granular. And so you want to especially or specifically say that, okay, this information is not TLP green, it's something else. For example, this bank account, I don't want this bank account to be marked as TLP green. So what I will do is I can specify that this bank account uh, is TLP red, for example. So it can really be granular. And that's what this small icon indicates. It means that it can have context attached to it. The other icon with the I and the slash means that you can select a distribution level for that attribute. So we'll talk in for about distribution in like five minutes or so. Uh, but basically, event can have a distribution, have you, as you saw previously, or when you edit it. But attribute can also have a distribution as well. And the last one with the double arrows means that this information is synchronized. So that means when you publish an event, uh, this information will be shared to other MISP instances, which is exactly the behavior that we want. I mean, if you encode IOCs, you want them to, you, you want to share them with uh, other people. All right, so that's it for attribute. Object. So you saw object also. Uh, once again, object, they are basically um, higher level concept, like a, a bigger building block that combines multiple attributes together when it makes sense. And so this composition of attributes, they're all defined based on the template, template that has the same name as the object. So in this case, the file object has a file template that describes what a, a file object looks like. And we have like other examples of what an object could be. It can be a file, person, credit card, device, uh, URL, and so on. And something that I have forgot to mention when we were dealing with the event graph, and that's also one of the reasons why we like to create object, is these arrows, these relationship that you create, you can only create them between objects. Or to be more precise, when an object is the source of the relationship. So in this case, we have an object and another object. So you can create a relationship between these two, either way. This one is an attribute. You can create a relationship from an object to an attribute, but you cannot create a relationship from an attribute to an object. That's a limitation in the system. Um, and it's also an incentive for you uh, to use object. All right. So one big advantage to use object, basically, you regroup information that makes sense together and you can create relationship between entities. Uh, when I say you regroup information that makes sense together, imagine you would have, uh, I don't know, three files. With these three files, they would all have uh, MD5, SHA1, SHA256, and a file name. And you would have all these file ashes like mangled in this table. You wouldn't know which file, uh, will which uh, file ash belong to which file because they would be all in that uh, table. But if you use an object, then re you regroup them and then you know for sure that these file ashes, they, they were derived from that uh, sample or that uh, attachment. Okay, next one is the event. Event, we've talked plenty about it. Uh, they basically are container or envelope uh, that contain information that are contextually linked. Event can have obviously tags, they can have their distribution level. They are also obviously synchronized with other MISP instances. And they contain anything related to their event, including attributes, event report, objects, um, yeah, and the context that go with it. All right. Next is event report. Event report, you saw it, it's simply a report. Um, you might have noticed when I show it at, uh, the first time that it has some time type of uh, highlighting, like with you can put uh, some stuff in bold as title uh, and so on. This is because you, reports are basically uh, supporting markdown, so they're markdown aware. 
so that you can format your report uh, quite easily and it's pleasant to read. But something that I haven't mentioned is that these reports, they, they have been like, the, in addition to being marked on aware, they also have a special syntax to reference data that is contained within an event. To show you an example, if I go back to my event, I look at my report, see I can edit it. I can add a bit of syntax. Incident. Could add a bit of boarding, whatever. Um, but I can also reference information that is contained within my event so that I don't have to have this uh, uh, this uh, hard-coded text in my report. So instead of having this bank account, I can just say that I want to reference um, an object. And I can choose the bank account. And you see I have this special syntax that I can use. And in the report, it shows me the bank account with anything that is interesting. So I would see not only the bank account, but also the object in which this bank account is part of and any tags that are com that are attached to that attribute. This is very nifty. So you can do that for object, you can do that for attributes, you can do that for pictures, that you can embed pictures in your report, and you can do that for tags. So you could pick any tags that were attached uh, to your event. So you have more stuff, uh, will uh, you explore it for those who are interested, where you can um, automatically extract entities and information and do the replacement automatically, or even create um, attribute from the report itself, or you have the, the way to do it manually where a replacement is available so we can quickly click on this one. It will do the replacement automatically in the report um, and also the data extraction where it will, it will convert uh, text uh, from the report into actual attributes and be saved. All right, for those who are interested to Feel free to play with it. Okay. So you can see on the screen, uh, event reports, they can have their own distribution. They are synchronized, but right now uh, you cannot tag them. So you cannot attach context. Object reference, uh, also called uh, relationship, is these links. So it's the relationship that links objects. So they are their own data point, uh, but it's pretty straightforward what they do. They have a source, they have a destination, and they have a keyword or verb uh, that represents the relationship that these two elements have together. So with them, you can describe various things such as behavior, similarities, affiliation, actions, uh, and so on and so forth. Ah, this one, it is good that we have this slide because this one I forgot to talk about. Um, but we'll talk about it more in the collaboration section. But basically, in MISP, this is a, I wanted to say a brand new feature, but it's a few months old already. But you have a way to attach notes, notes, opinion, and relationship between basically, basically anything that you have on a MISP instance. Uh, so in this case, we have uh, a small note that was added by Alexandre uh, and uh, a small opinion. Now, the context. So we've covered quickly some uh, some uh, entities from the data layer, and now let's have a look at the context layer. And as I told you at the beginning, basically any context that you will add on your data layer are actually tags. But these tags, they come from three different sources. The first one is the free tags. So it's just a, a label that can be set without restrictions. So if you want to create your own tag, you can do it. If you can, want to create a tag called foobar, you can do it. And it's MISP will allow you to do that. But this is not uh, the best thing to do because, uh, I mean, you are going to probably share data with third parties, and they might not understand what your foobar tags mean. That's one of the reasons why we introduced taxonomies and galaxies, where they're basically normalized classification. 
Okay, let's quickly have a look at these three sources. So the free tag, as I've mentioned, um, they can be set without restriction. And even though it's quite practical sometimes to be able to create your own tag, uh, it can make things complex automation-wise. So if you ever wrote some automation or export script, uh, you will quickly realize that uh, if you have to deal with this uh, uh, source of uh, creativity, let's say, um, this can become quickly difficult to manage because uh, this same concept has been uh, like written in multiple ways. As for a human, it's quite easy to understand that they all represent the same concept, but for a machine, uh, if you had to specify that you want to export anything that is marked with TLP Ember, you have to take into account that sometimes it can have double columns, sometimes it can have a dash, sometimes it's all uppercase, sometimes it says threads in before it, so you clearly realize that uh, it's quite difficult. So that's one of the reasons why we introduce taxonomies. So taxonomies... They are basically a normalized set of vocabularies uh, that is globally understood because they are available by default on any MISP installation. And it really, so you, using taxonomies really ease the consumption of the information because all the tags, they look the same. So for users, it's really easy to scan through a page and check and see the tags uh, that are assigned to, to the entities. And it makes automation so much easier because the tags are normalized, so they always have the same form. So you see, for example, it's simply column member. And so when you export your data, you can expect um, data under the Ember uh, classification to have that specific format. Now, I've mentioned taxonomies, but I also mentioned galaxies or galaxy clusters. And if you remember previously, we also used that when we added the attack patterns. But let's see what a galaxy is and why do we have galaxies and taxonomies? So a galaxy, and sorry for the naming convention, it's how it is in this. So a galaxy is actually the name of the collection and the cluster is the name of the item in that collection. So we have a small example. If we use the country galaxy, uh, the name of the galaxy is country and the cluster in that galaxy would be, for example, Luxembourg. So basically, it's just an item in that collection. So in the country galaxy, we have the cluster Luxembourg, but we also have the cluster Germany, we also have the cluster France, we also have the cluster Belgium, and so on and so forth. So in addition to just being this normalized set because it's really, for now, it just looks like a taxonomy, right? But it's more than that. In addition to being normalized, these clusters, they also, as it says on the slide, boosted by metadata. So what I mean by boosted is that you have um, some meta information associated to that cluster that gives a lot, of, lot more information. So in this case, we have on the, the page three screenshots first one is a thread actor APT29 attached to an event. Then that APT29, we see that it has some relationship to other galaxies and they are, that they are linked to other clusters. So APT29 from the thread actor galaxy has a relationship that says that it is similar with a likelihood probability of likely to the APT29-G0016 from another galaxy called Maitre Enterprise Attack Intrusion Set. So if you have, if you are using other like sources of classification of thread actors, sometimes it makes a lot of sense to have this relationship because uh, if you are dealing with uh, a lot of thread actors, um, you, you probably realize that vendors, they like to call thread actors by different names. And so having this relationship is really, really cool to have. Because you, you might be wondering, okay, APT29, but uh, uh, I mean, I don't know APT29. I know the name Cozy Bear. Uh, so you would see that, uh, that relationship. And the last one, the screenshot at the bottom, is a key value, that, uh, key value table that gives also a lot of information about that cluster. 
So in this case, for APT29, this is just a sample because we have way more data for this one. But we have like the suspected victim, uh, the state that is sponsoring uh, that uh, that threat actor, and much more information. Now, to give another example with Luxembourg, the cluster of Luxembourg, what we would find in this table would be, for example, the TLD, uh, the currency used, the uh, the capital, for example, uh, the amount of people living in that country, and so on and so forth. So it's meta information related to that cluster. So quick table to compare the two galaxies and taxonomies. So both of them, they are normalized classification, right? Because they are all written in the same way and they are globally understood by everyone. On the left side, we have taxonomies. Any tags are self-explanatory. So whenever you will see a tag from a taxonomy, by just looking at the tag, you immediately know what it does, what it means. So TLP, like TLP, I think it's the most uh, evident case. If you see TLP red, you know that, okay, TLP red, I'm not supposed to disclose anything related to that information. Um, for Galaxy, it's more complex because they describe higher level information, right? So even though if you look at APT29, it can be self-explanatory for you, but since it contains much more details and meta information, we make it like as a higher level uh, type of information. Um, another way to see it is that taxonomies, they are typically used for categorization. So TLP red, I mean, it's a way to classify things. Um, while Galaxy, they are usually more used for providing contextual information. For example, the country provide contextual information that, okay, this uh, country uh, is being involved in that attack or is, be, or is the target of that attack. For example, this threat actor uh, is uh, the one that carried out that attack. And some example of taxonomies and uh, galaxies, TLP, adversary, phishing, false positive that we haven't talked about at allows you to estimate how likely is this data point to false positive or not. And on the right side, galaxies, for example, it can be like the country galaxy, the threat actors, my tree attack that we've talked about a bit, uh, yeah, and other galaxy matrix that looks like a my tree attack matrix. Okay, quick usage on tags. So you saw me tag stuff already. By what between the sides? Okay, so let's quickly recap what you can do with tags. So tags they can be attached on different elements. You can attach them on events. We've done that already. Like this, you can attach them also on attribute. We've done that already. But something that we didn't do is that you can also create what we call a relationship verb. So let's, for example. Consider this case. If you have a trade actor called so trade actor Earth Luska. Um, so this is the cluster, Earth Luska, and this is the galaxy. And you can see we have that relationship verb that says that um, the incident or attack is attributed to this one. Same with country. So country in this case, we can see that China. Uh, so China carried out that attack because it says that this uh, incident is attributed to China. But what we also see is that China is also the target of that attack. So we can see with these two clusters, they are basically almost the same, but one's, one is actually the one that is performing the attack and the, the other one is the target or the recipient of that attack. Uh, and we can see the, the producer, Trend Micro, and we see that this blog post, or uh, I don't know what exactly this event was, uh, but the information was authored by Trend Micro. So you can see, sometimes it's not enough to just provide the clusters and the contextualization. Sometimes you want to add a relationship that link this piece of context with the uh, the element for which uh, to which it is attached to. And this is exactly the purpose of these relationship verbs. So let's quickly see how you can do it. Um, let's let's say that this successful scam was uh, uh, 
is being uh, done on the one in Luxembourg. So full namespace, I would take country or target information. I kind of like target information. And then I could say Luxembourg. You can see all the different synonyms. So if I were to search for, uh, instead of Luxembourg for uh, Grand Déchet, you can see that detects the, the synonym correctly. But this is quite cool, the support of synonym. So I am adding this. And then if I want to say that, okay, this uh, attack targets Luxembourg, so I want to add the targets uh, relationship verb, I click on this small button, modify tag relationship, select targets, click submit, and there we go. Okay. And last but not least about the usage, uh, you can have two modes of tag. You can have the global or the local tags. And I'm sure if you were paying attention, at least close attention to what I was doing, uh, you notice that we have two buttons to add tags, one with a globe and one with a small individual. And we have that for basically all tags and galaxies. So this might be a bit confusing, but this is a global tag with the globe and a local tag with the small person. So the difference between the two. If you use a global tag, it's what you would expect to happen. So you attach a tag like TLP clear in this case, or the, the producer trend macro to that, uh, uh, to that tag. And this tag will be like synchronized, well, visible to everyone. It will be synchronized when, when you will share the event. And I've uh, said the important word, synchronized. Because if you use a local tag, this information will be visible to everyone, but that, uh, that specific tag will not be synchronized to other instances. And so typically when you encode information, you will always use global tag. And local tag, you will use them most of the time when you want to introduce some kind of automation or collaboration within the same team. So in this case, um, the author of that event attached the tag workflow to do, review the source credibility. So if um, I was working in a team and one of my colleagues attached this tag, I know that I have to review the credibility of the source uh, to make sure that this event doesn't have many false positives or to make sure that data is relevant and that uh, information is legitimate. So it can be used for like collaboration or coordination, but also for automation. Like if I have a curation pipeline running, uh, like uh, that would automatically uh, fetch the data and review the source credibility with some scripts. Automatically, my script can like collect any data that are marked with that tag, process it, and then get rid of the tag. And this is something that is quite uh, frequently done in the in the industry. So to to make it short, global tag so that it's visible and shared to everyone. Local tag, it stays on your MISP instance. It's not going to be synchronized and it's typically meant for coordination or automation. All right. Now touching the subject of correlation and that we've talk quite a bit already about correlation, but let's see how it works in practice. So <laughs> this is a, a big event that correlates a lot. Uh, to make it short, correlation, they are basically linked, link that are created automatically, so you don't have to do anything, between attributes that belong to different events. So you remember when I created my event there, automatically, um, Correlation link were created with event that you created when I was doing my own event. And so they are based, so these correlations, they are based on attributes. So you can see this attribute has been added and it is also included in another event. So correlation are done across event based on the attribute. So if you see, 
it's not really visible. But uh, um, so on the left side, you have one event that contains multiple attributes, that contain multiple objects. And on the right side, you have also another event. And what you can see is that a correlation in MISP is created automatically and it links attribute that belongs to two different events. But how does it link these two attributes? Well, it, we have like three types of correlation. The first one is what we call the string value correlation, where the exact same value must be present on the other side. So if this attribute has the value dead beef, to have a correlation with the string value type, the attribute on the right side must have the exact same value dead beef. Okay. The next one is what we call side or block correlation. It's basically if an IP address is contained within a side or block defined on whichever side, you will have a correlation uh, created automatically. So if you have 1.1.1.0 slash 24 on the left side and 1.1.1.128 on the right side, as this later IP address is contained in the side or block on the left side, you will have a correlation link. And the last one, which is very uh, nifty when you are dealing with uh, uh, malwares and so on, is what we call SSD hash. So SSD is um, what we call uh, fuzzy hashing. So basically when you have, um, okay, so to quickly explain uh, what fuzzy hashing is, if you have a file and you compute a file hash of that file, for example, MD5 or SHA-1, um, you will have a fingerprint. If you change one bit in the original file, the fingerprint will be totally different because the two uh, files are not the same. But with fuzzy hashing, if you flip one bit on the original file, the resulting fuzzy hash will be almost exactly the same between the two files. And so as it will be almost exactly the same, you will be able to draw conclusion that uh, these two files might be related or are actually really close. And so this is more or less how it works. Obviously, everything is configurable. So if you go in the settings, you can set the different thresholds and so on. But it's very nifty to see that two files, or in our case, most of the time, at least in our uh, uh, use case, these two malware samples are really close to each other. All right. And now that I've explained to you um, how correlation works, now you might understand why I was a bit uh, pushy in exploding that URL. Because now you know that what correlates is actually the attribute, not the object, so the whole attribute. And so if that domain name was reused, and instead of having assets slash bin.exe, we would have assets slash bin2.exe. So if I do this on the URL, look, now on the right side, we don't have correlation anymore. See, we have this correlation for these uh, attributes because one of you encoded these as attribute, but this URL, even though it's almost the same as uh, the one that it used to be, we don't have any correlation anymore because the exact value is not the same. But if you explode that URL into multiple components, you still keep this correlation. So now we still have a correlation for that domain. So if that domain gets reused, we have the correlation. If that query string would be something really like, uh, I don't know, specific, something like this, and it is reused, but in another domain, then we would get uh, the correlation link between the two. If that uh, resource uh, uh, path was used. Okay, this I will skip. And last but not least, distribution level. Okay. So let's go back to our event. So distribution, when you create an event or you edit an event, you can see we have many distribution uh, to choose from. We have your organization only, this community only, 
connected communities and all communities. So let's see what, what it means to select one of these. The first one and the one we used so far is called organization only. That means only your organization, when I say your organization is the organization uh, uh, that is assigned to your user. So only your organization can view the data. If we go back to the event I created, this one, this one has the distribution, your organization only. That means if you connect uh, to the instance and have a look at the event index, you won't see my event in the index list. You will still see the event of uh, other people that created the event today. So these five events, you will still see them because you are all part of the same organization. But my event, uh, as I'm not part of your organization, your organization is org main mine, it's org name, and the distribution is set to organization only, you are not able to see my event in this list. But what I will do now is to make it less restrictive and use this community only. So this community, it basically means the server on which you are on. So now that I've changed the distribution to this community, now you can view my event because we are all on the same community. And when I say community, I mean this MISP server. So as we are all on this community, you can all see my event. Okay, but so far we haven't introduced the concept of sharing, right? Because organization only means only me can only me and my organization can view it. This community means anyone that have access to that server can see it. But if you want to actually start sharing, you have to pick something even more lax than this community, and that could be connected communities. Connected communities means basically this community. So any users that are that have access to the server, but also any connected servers to the first one. So if you have a look at a small graph or diagram, sorry, if we start from the gray MISP on the right side, each box is a MISP instance, okay? So we have multiple orgs in this MISP instance. If you select this community, only the organization that have access to the gray MISP instance can view the data. If you use connected communities, any organization that have access to the gray MISP instance can view the data, but the data will be shared to the connected MISP instance that are connected to the gray MISP instance, but not further. So the yellow that is directly connected to the gray will receive the data, and the red that is connected to the gray will also receive the data. But green and purple, they won't receive it because it's only the connected communities that are allowed to receive the data. And the last one, as you might guess, all communities basically means no restriction on propagation as long as there is a connection. So if I were to select all communities, now the information can be propagated to the yellow, red, but also the green and the purple one. As long as there is a connection between uh, instances, information will be propagated. Just a side note, that doesn't mean that uh, it's uh, similar to publishing it online. Like if you create uh, an event and you put it as uh, all communities, if I'm running my MISP instance uh, and I'm not connected to any of the MISP instance in this diagram, I will never receive the data because I need to have an active and a valid connection, uh, like basically a path that would join the gray MISP instance and my MISP instance. Okay. So when you, uh, when you have uh, chosen your distribution level and when you want to publish, it will always tell you what is and what will be the recipient. So which servers are going to have that information? So in this case, as we have chosen all communities, sorry, this four MISP server will receive it. If I choose this community only, and I try to push, you can see that none of this server will receive it because the distribution of this event blocks it from being pushed. So it's also a quite uh, uh, handy reminder. 
Okay. But there is one last, uh, two last distribution setting that we haven't talked about. The last one, inherit event, it basically means that the data will default to the distribution of the event. So you cannot pick inherit event for an event. Hmm? Let's uh, save this community. But you can pick inherit event for an attribute. Inherit event basically means uh, take the distribution of that event and apply and apply it to my attribute. Okay. So, so since mark with inherit event or also assign this community only. And now if you remember what we did previously, we changed the distribution setting from inherit to organizationally for some elements. We did it for uh, the object bank account and we did it for the object person. That means regardless of the distribution of my event, I'm forcing the distribution of that object to be your organization only. Right? So you can really be granular with that. Oops. And so what happens when you have conflicting distribution? Well, the final distribution that will be used is always the most restrictive one, where basically event propagate distribution on the object, an object propagates the distribution on the attribute, but the most restri restrictive one will be taken. Like in this example, let's simulate this one. So the event is set to all communities. Then we have an object that is set to org only, like in this case. And then we have an attribute that is set to connected communities. If we are in this situation, this, object, this attribute and basically this whole object will never be visible to anyone outside of my organization because the most restrictive distribution is taken. Even though all communities and connected communities are used for uh, the event and the attribute respectively, your organization only overrule any of these distribution and force it to be that way. Okay, and last but not least, sharing groups. So sharing groups, um, it's uh, we also call it distribution lists, and it allows you to specific specifically uh, uh, list which organization are part of that group and which organization can view the data. So this is an example of a sharing group um, called Banking Sector in Europe. And we can see that these organizations on the left side, so training, Funking, Hungarian Bank, AFB, Italian Bank, and CNCNL, these five uh, organizations, they are part of that sharing group. And if we assign that uh, an event or an attribute to that sharing group, only if these five organizations will be able to have access to the data. So let's quickly create a sharing group so that org name, and your organization called Orkmain uh, can share data, but only between these two organizations. So to do that, global action and then this sharing group, and then I click on add sharing group. Your idea will leave it empty. Name, I will call, I will call our sharing group only Orkmain and Orkmain. Releasable to, I can even copy paste. I can give a description, but um, I don't want to. And then I can add organization. So org name is already checked by default because as I'm creating the sharing group, automatically my organization is added to that sharing group. And now we'll also add your organization org main. Click on next. Um, I enable roaming mode so that the sharing group can also uh, be like propagated to other MISP instance. I click on next, and then I have a small summary that explains what I'm about to create. I click on submit. Now I have created my sharing group with my organization and yours. And if I go back to my event, 
I can now assign my event to our sharing group. And if I do that, now you can see the distribution has been changed. And now you can view my event, but only if you are part of OrcMain. If you were connected as um, uh, like Orc1 or any of these org, you will not be able to see the event because you are not part of that sharing group. And that's what we have on this uh, last slide. Why we have defined a, sh a blue sharing group that uh, uh, where this four organization are part of that sharing group. But we have two other organizations that are not part of that sharing group. And so if you create an event and assign it to the blue sharing group, only this organization will be able to see the data. And you can also see that the event will be synchronized to eligible MISP instances. And only the organization that are part of that blue sharing group will be able to see the data if they are part of that sharing group, obviously. All right. That's basically it for a quick recap of the different data model and structure and distribution. So now that we've encoded information, sometimes you want to search for that information and to aggregate it. So how can you search for information? Let's take, for example, that domain. When you're in this uh, event index view, you can obviously search for attribute. You just need to click on search attribute, and then you have this form that contains a lot of filtering uh, option for you. But most of the time you will just use the first box, which is like you are searching for any attribute that contain this expression. You can specify the type of the attribute or the category, but you can leave it empty. You can click on search and you will get the result. So I can see that this attribute, so that domain, uh, is part of one, two, three, four events. So event 58, the one I created, it's your name. And these four events that uh, other users on this instance have created. You see, it's quite easy to do. Uh, you can also enforce the fact that this attribute should be marked as a an IOC. And we'll see, quickly see that we all did that, uh, that uh, part. So we all flagged that attribute as being meant for protective tools. Okay, so that's one way to find attributes. But you can also uh, search other data points. For example, you can search for the event title. So if we search for scam, event info, click on filter, and then I will get any event that have the word scam in their title. Um, if you know the ID you ID, you can do it as well. If you know a tag, you can also do it like a green. Ah, TP green. There we go. You will have all events that are marked with TLP green. But you can be even more precise. When you're viewing this index, you have a magnifying glass there. And if you click on this, you have a kind of query builder that allows you to specify a lot of things. For example, tagged, we used uh, TLP green previously. So you can add that condition. Then you can say that you want um, that the organization that created the data is org main. And you want the distribution setting to be, I don't know what you guys used. Let's say all. You apply and you get the result. So you can see org main, TLP green, and distribution setting all. Right. And this creates a URL that you can share, obviously. Or even better, that you can bookmark. So whenever you're on this, oops, click on this, and you have it bookmarked. Quite handy. And the last aspect on where you can search for data is in the event itself. So you can quickly search for an attribute value. Mm -hmm. But you also have that query builder thing uh, that is hidden in the filtering tool button there. So you can, you have many options. 
can choose if it's a proposal or not. You can choose if it has like warnings from the warning list. You can choose if it's deleted or not. You can choose if it has some server correlations. You can view only the attribute that have the IDS flag set. So you can really filter a lot of things there. All right. Now for aggregating information. You have two ways. Uh, well, two easy ways uh, to aggregate information using the UI. The first one is to use what we call a periodic summary. And you can access these summaries when you are viewing the event index. And on the left sidebar, you have the view periodic summary link. If you click on, click on this one, it will show you like a daily, weekly or monthly summary of whatever was created. So you can view the amount of publish event, the amount of attribute object. So you have some metrics. You have metrics about the context. So the top 10 MITRE attack techniques that were used, the top 10 attribute uh, type, top 10 misp object, any event report that were created, uh, the top tags, a list of all events that were created, and then some trendings. Uh, so you can see the, uh, like if uh, some tags or you attack pattern were more used uh, like yesterday or two days ago. And a lot more information about the context. And last section is about the security recommendation that are derived based on the context that were used on all events. So based on the social engineering, based on the attack pattern that were used, you can derive some preventive measure or mitigation and it is basically a small report that uh, uh, order the preventive measure that sh should be put in place to mitigate uh, the technique used by the attackers. So you can use it for daily, you can use it for weekly or monthly, or can even specify the amount of days. This is something that you can access in the UI, as you can see. But you can also configure MISP to send these daily, weekly, or monthly uh, email, uh, summary email. So if you are not inserting in getting, interested in getting this event notification uh, every time an event is published and you are only interested in the daily notification, then you can just subscribe to the daily notification in your user profile. All right. So we have uh, like something like 10 minutes left and we'll quickly go through some collaboration feature that you can use uh, to collaborate uh, in your team or to collaborate with third parties uh, and so on. So let's, I will take one of your events and let's see what we have. I see that uh, someone created uh, 8888. Um, so 8888 for me, I clearly see this is um, a false positive. So there are multiple things that I can do. I can like check who created uh, that uh, that event. So I see it's Orkmain and I can get in touch with Orkmain and tell them, okay, this is a false positive, please turn it off. But this requires creating an email, writing the email, and this is not very convenient. And yeah especially that we have a system that could be used for that. So if you, if you want to tell someone that uh, they did a typo or a mistake, or maybe at some point this was valid, but it, now it's not valid anymore, you can create what we call a proposal. Creating a proposal, it's easy. You click on the propose edit button. And now you can view it's a form that is really similar to the add attribute form, you can see add proposal, add attribute, it's really similar. But we are not creating an attribute, we are creating a proposal. And in this case, what I'm doing is I'm just asking you to turn off the IDS flag for that attribute. I click on propose, and what we have is a proposal, you can view it, it's clearly visible with the orange color. This proposal um, latches onto the original attribute and uh, the recipient, so the one that created the event, can view that proposal and they can decide to accept that proposal or discard it. 
right? So if they think that this proposal is indeed valid, they would click on accept and automatically the two ideas flag will be disabled. If they think this is like not interesting and they want to keep it that way, they can just discard the proposal and it will be simply ignored. Something else that could, that could do, uh, in addition on creating that proposal, is creating what we call an analyst note or an analyst opinion. So if you remember in one of the slide decks I show you, I mentioned analyst data where you can create notes and opinion on entities. And you can do it on attribute, obviously. So if I click on this one, I can add a note or I can add an opinion on that one. In this case, I will add an opinion. I will say that uh, I strongly disagree with that uh, IOC and I say this is clearly a false positive. Please disable the two ideas flag. I can specify the distribution. So I want it to be visible to everyone. Uh, I can say that I'm the author. I hit submit. And now we have this small label that is attached next to that attribute. And if I click on it, I see the opinion that I've added. And let's imagine I'm just cheating because I'm the same user, but let's imagine that someone wants to reply. Uh, they can create a note on that opinion. So they can say visible to everyone. They can specify the language and they can say, yes, I agree. Oops. And now you can see that we have attach this note on the original opinion. So you can really like send messages, collaborate, provide opinion, provide feedback using this uh, note and opinion system. All right. So another thing that you can do for collaboration purposes is to create what we call an extended event. So let's consider that this event that you created, I find it very interesting and I want to add more information to that event, but I don't want to disclose this information to you. So there are two ways for me to do it. I can duplicate that event, but this is not really efficient because I would have like to, to create all the object, create all the attributes, and it will like create some uh, space on the, in the database, create some overhead and so on, which is not something that I want. I want it to be efficient. So what I can do is create an extended event. An extended event is basically a new event, but this new event has a link to the original event that says that my event is an extension of this other one. So to create an extended event, it's quite easy. You just click on this button, extend this event. You will end up in this form, add event. So you remember, this is the form that we filled in the beginning to create a new event. But this extend event uh, field that I've purposely ignored is pre-filled with the UID of my event that I'm currently extending. So the only thing that I have to do is to, if I want, change the distribution level so that this event is only kept to myself and I can say something like additional information about this case that I don't want to disclose to third parties, for example. I click submit. And now I have my empty event for which I can add more data. So let's quickly add a, a comment. Mm -hmm. So now I have my event that I can totally modify because it's my event. And I still have the link or reference to the original event that I extended. So if I pivot to that parent event, you can see now that this parent event is being extended by a child event, event 64 that I created just a second before. And if I click on this button, I switch to the extended view that is indicated with the extended view in brackets on the top. And now I can view a combination of the data from both the parent event and the child event. So you can see the data 
the parent event that was created by Arcmain and the data from the child event, you can see event 60, event 64, that data that was created by Orkname, my organization. So it's like a combined view of all the events that uh, extend that parent event. So why would you do that? So once again, if you want to provide additional details to uh, an event, but you don't want to disclose uh, that additional detail to everyone, uh, for example, you could, instead of choosing all communities, you could uh, create that extended event and set it to a sharing group. That's totally fine. Um, you can also create an extended event to have competitive analysis so that if you like really don't agree with what, what have been defined there, you can add your own point of view of that event. So this is quite a nice way to like quickly provide uh, information without duplicating data because you still have the original link to the parent event. All right. I think I've covered most of the things I wanted to cover today. Yes, so we are a bit early. So, I mean, if you have more questions or whatever, please feel free to like write them in the chat uh, and we can reply. Um, otherwise, um, for those who are interested in the next uh, training uh, tomorrow, that will be about main, mostly administration, deployment, integration, and automation. So we'll go over like ACL and ownership, uh, how to set up synchronization between servers and feeds. Um, we'll tackle the problem of deletion because uh, we haven't talked about deletion today, but this is a special case because we are in MISP, we are in a peer-to-peer -peer network where information is shared left and right. So deletion is a special case. Um, we'll talk about block listing. We'll talk about the different settings and how to diagnose uh, the different uh, uh, issues if you encounter any. Uh, quickly talk about the deployment options uh, that is available. And the, the fun part, uh, we'll talk about integration, so how to automate things, how to use the API, uh, how to use the, the workflow system that MISP uh, has built in. And if we have some time at the end of the session, we'll see how you can create your own enrichment module or how you can create your own import module. All right, so let's quickly check in the chat if we have any questions. So will the recording be uploaded to the web? Yes, absolutely. Um, excellent. Okay. Does LDAP work in this? Yes, it works. You have to configure it yourself, but we have many authentication plugins for that quickly show you what we have available. Um, so if you go on GitHub MISP, oh, not MISP, oops. oops. Oh. No, it's not there, sorry. Okay, so these are um, all the authentication plugin that we have available. So we have uh, uh, LindoTP, we have uh, oh no, it's Active Directory, we also have OpenID Connect. Uh, and in each of these folders, uh, we have a small readme file that explains how you can configure this. Uh, so this is for uh, uh, Azure AD, and I believe we have one. Um, where is it? I know that we have one for uh, LDAP. Don't remember exactly which one it is. Well, mostly Googling LDAP and MISP will get you to the correct link. <laughs> but I'm, uh, I'm remember that there is one. Uh, oh, perfect. So I'll explain that uh, the documentation. 
about that specific one. So it's not bad. You even have a tutorial on how to set it up. Thanks, Alex. Uh, what's next? Yes, the presentation will be shared online. Don't worry. All right. Um, well, if you don't have more questions, that's it for today. Thank you, everyone, for joining. And for those who are joining us tomorrow, uh, well, see you tomorrow. Thank you.